heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from London and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll have full market coverage after a wild week for tech stocks. Plus, Apple losing ground in China. We'll break down why. And as the Paris Olympics kick off, they brace for an onslaught of cyber attacks. But first, let's check in on these markets. An extraordinary week. In fact, we have been down for three straight weeks on the Nasdaq 100. This week, we lose about 3%. It is the worst week, well, only since the re previous week, since last week, Ed, but we are trading basically at the low since May, and we've wiped off a ton of market capitalization. Yeah, and I think a big part of the story is the magnificent seven. I think you've already shown this Bloomberg terminal chart this week, Caro, but it's kind of the go-to. You know, in the, the past two sessions, Wednesday, Thursday, almost a trillion dollars of market cap are raised, and that has a broader impact on Markets at an index level, but I think largely Google, which we'll talk about later in the program specifically, and volatility in NVIDIA, it's still top of mind for so many investors. So let's talk about it. Joining us for more is Anthony Saglimbeni and, and, and Mera Price. Sorry, it's Friday. Not enough coffee. Financial chief market strategist. The market volatility, it gets you, it gets me. Antti, welcome back to the program. I mean, I've framed it in a very specific way. We're still micro-focused on the MAG7, whether it's a weighting uh, consideration or whether it's just a news flow consideration. For someone like you looking at the markets, is that still truly the case? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the next few weeks are all about earnings. Um, we're going to have a big week. If you thought this week was volatile, wait for next week. Uh, we have Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Meta, all of these companies are reporting. They're about a third of the NASDAQ by market cap weight. And so there's going to be a lot of attention on the earnings from these MAG7 names. Uh, and when we get later in August, we're going to see NVIDIA. And that's been the big uh, story in the first half of what's been driving the market higher. So I think there's a little bit of trepidation around earnings. Uh, season. I, I think earnings are going to be fine for uh, the MAG-7, um, but there's certainly some trepidation if they're going to meet kind of the whisper numbers and the expectations that have been set, which are very high. Valuations are very high in, in these MAG-7 names. And I think the market's yeah. starting to pay a little bit more attention to all the stocks that didn't keep uh, pace with the MAG-7, uh, financials, small caps, cyclicals, outside of tech. These are the areas that are driving the market right now. Anthony, have you been one of those who've thought that the valuations have become silly, absurd, or have you actually thought there was reason for NVIDIA getting to its $3 trillion market cap? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to question some of the valuations of big tech right now, certainly based on, you know, AI and some of the, the payoffs that may take a, a few more quarters or years uh, to develop. And so I think it's right for investors to question some of the valuations. But I also think the secular drivers of artificial intelligence um, are real, and I think they will generate profit for these companies. They're already generating profits for companies like NVIDIA and Microsoft and Alphabet. It's just the question, are they meeting elevated expectations right now? And it's normal to see over the course of a cycle, um, investors kind of get ahead of where the, the profits really are. They take those, expect, those expectations back provides an opportunity for investors to look at some of these stocks that have really moved higher, maybe at a little bit cheaper price. And so if you have a balanced view um, of both growth and some of the cyclical opportunities that have developed, I think you can use a pullback in big tech as a means to put more, uh, more dollars to work. And see, one reason that we, we watch Alphabet, the parent of Google, so closely is largely because it goes first, right? And it gives an, us an indication of how cloud will do, but also advertising will do. And then that sets us up for this week, next week, that you, you uh, perfectly framed for us. But there is more to the market than just earnings. Are you able to apportion some weighting to how much the market is looking at the rate cycle against what the MAG7 do in terms of EPS growth? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Um, obviously, in the first half, there was a lot of questions about the economy, inflation, interest rates. And so a lot of investors piled into big tech because the profits of these companies um, were very visible. I think what we're seeing in the second half, or at least at the start, is that there's a little bit more clarity or certainty about a soft landing. Uh, interest rates look like they might come down starting in September from a Fed rate cut. Um, inflation is moderating lower. We saw that in the PCE data. Uh, th this morning. And so I think there's a little bit more confidence in the other, you know, 493 S&P 500 companies that their profits and their outlooks might actually improve in the second half. And so that macro backdrop that was a little bit more uncertain in the first half is starting to get clarity in the second half. And I think that's why you're seeing some money rotate out of big tech and those magnificent seven names and into some of the areas like small caps and financials and industrials and materials, which are performing better today. Um, I think investors are starting to give those areas a second look. Anthony, the reason we love your experience over the last couple of decades is because you don't just look at certain equities or asset classes, but you look globally as well. This rotation, it's kind of been happening in the Japanese names have sold off, European chip makers too. And I'm interested as to whether or not you're seeing some global narratives build as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, you're certainly seeing normalization in terms of economic growth patterns, inflation and interest rates, not only here in the U.S., but in Europe, um, in Japan. Japan uh, will have their uh, Fed, uh, their, their BOJ meeting next week. Um, they're talking about actually normalizing policy by hiking rates. Um, in Europe, you've seen the ECB uh, cut rates in June. June, they're on pace to cut rates again in September. That's because there's this balance between growth and inflation. And, and think about the narrative over the last two years, not only in the U.S., but across the globe of really high inflation, really high growth and really high interest rates. And what we've seen over the last six to 12 months is more normalization in inflation, um, the opportunity to normalize interest rates and a, a pretty solid economic environment in Europe and in uh, Japan. These areas are performing well and could continue to perform well if investors look for that cyclical trade uh, outside of big tech, which is really dominating U.S. indices. Anthony, it's always great to catch up with you. Happy weekend. Anthony Seglomeni of Ameriprise Financial. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, coming up, Apple losing ground in its key China market. We're going to be breaking down the iPhone's decline next. And what are you watching? I'm looking at another Chinese name. In a week that's been, let's be honest, pretty rubbish for electric vehicle makers, CATL, which is the world's biggest maker of EV batteries, is bucking a trend. They actually reported a pretty impressive second quarter net income number. So while we're all down about EVs, the battery maker's doing well, and its peer LG Energy Solutions hadn't done as well. So it's really hard to understand this story, but it's one name that we watch over in China, given it's the world's leader in EV sales. Be right back. This is Bloomberg Technology. Apple's losing ground in the China market, with the iPhone officially falling out of the top five in the nation, according to new data from IDC. Let's break it all down with Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Anurag Rana. That's a very interesting table we're showing. And there's actually a chart within the Bloomberg News story that shows the sort of slide in position that Apple has had. Um, relatively short term, Anurag, right? I'm thinking towards the end of 2023, over a six month period. What does the data tell you? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things I would say this, you know, when it comes to Apple and, and China, uh, we know over the last few years the growth has not been there. But the comment I will take you back to what they said in their last earnings call is they grew in China while all third-party data providers were saying that, you know, China shipments are down. Now, there is always a timing issue in terms of, you know, when the, sh the product is ship out, shipped out of the warehouse versus when it's activated, when it's recognized as revenue. So I think next week's earnings is going to be extremely important to see what's really going on in China. For, for Apple. And I think because, you know, to be fairly blunt, that is the most important thing for over the next 12 months for uh, Apple, far more than, you know, anything else at this point. 
the way in which the IDC tracks the data, whether it's government, whether it's actually seeing what third parties are really up to, we can sort of try and dig into the nuance there, Anurag. But the overall narrative seems to be that Apple loses position and Huawei gains. Is that the right one to make? Oh, yeah. But that's because over the last 12 months, we have seen a massive upgrade in Huawei phones. But there's a reason for it, because Huawei hadn't, you know, launched a phone for several years. So the people who had the older phones were going out to go out and refresh that or buy the newer ones. Whereas, as we know, for Apple iPhones, we are seeing an elongation in the refresh cycle because the product's been, you know, a far more reliable product as well as it's expensive. So people are keeping it longer. So that really has been the biggest issue for Apple for over the last Last, I would say two and a half years or so. The domestic Chinese handset makers are a factor here, right, Anna Rag? And Bloomberg's reported about government policy directing government employees or state backed enterprises to leave the iPhone at home. How do you model that at Bloomberg Intelligence, that kind of policy perspective? Yeah, and again, as I said, you know, going into the last quarter earnings, all of these things were, you know, at play at that time too. Meanwhile, Apple came out and said that they grew in the greater China region. And that's why I am more inclined to wait to wait for Apple's comments rather than any of the data sources. And But having said that, I think Apple is going to have a bit of a tough time if you see the Republican, uh, you know, president coming in because if, if the China rhetoric is going to go up over the next two to three years, you know, Apple's going to be right in the middle of the U.S.-China issue. So I, I think really um, Apple's not as clear cut at this point compared to, you know, let's say somebody like an Amazon or Microsoft in terms of the visibility over the next two to three years. Of course, we had that reporting earlier in the week that Micron and Apple executives were visiting China of late and talking to Government officials, Anurag Rana, great to have some time with you. Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you. Meanwhile, let's just talk about how politics is affecting China-U.S. relationships a bit more. China-based bike dance is going all out in Washington to keep TikTok from being banned with lawyers, lobbyists and, of course, with money. Joining us now with the details, Mike Shepard. You understand more than many the intricacies of U.S. and China relationships. And TikTok is just fighting this hard because they have to or they're going to be out. This is really existential for TikTok and for ByteDance to be able to maintain this kind of access through TikTok and its 170 million users to what may be the most lucrative advertising market in the world. And TikTok is not going gently into that good night in the face of this uh, law that was passed and signed in April. Uh, it requires the company, the app, to be sold by ByteDance by January 19th or it will face a ban on its U.S. operations. And that would be devastating to the company and also to U.S. users who have really grown to uh, depend on it, uh, not only as a source of entertainment, but also as a source of income and business. There are many small businesses who are active on the app as well. And TikTok is deploying them, too, as part of this campaign. Mike, there, there's an issue of language here that I find just crucial, that when this law was passed in April, it was a divest or ban law. And, and it just seems like the divest part is, is just not a talking point for TikTok or the US government at this stage. I'm glad you brought that up, Ed, because when you see, for example, Vice President Harris joining TikTok uh, as of yesterday uh, to help boost her campaign against uh, President Donald, former President Donald Trump, what we are what we are seeing is that there is great utility in this app. The app itself is not the issue. It really is the ownership. However, we are seeing zero movement when it comes to a sale. ByteDance says TikTok is not up for sale. The Chinese government has expressed objections to any idea that this crown jewel of ByteDance would be forced to be sold by the U.S. government. Bloomberg's Mike Shepard, who leads our coverage of tech and politics. Thank you very much. A story that Mike just mentioned in the context of TikTok. Vice President Kamala Harris officially joined the app with her first personal account. Since she began her presidential campaign four days ago, TikTok and other social media platforms have seen a groundswell of viral memes, images and videos all featuring the vice president. Worth noting, President Joe Biden did sign that law into for, uh, bill in April, forcing 
ByteDance to sell the app by January, as Michael outlined, or face the prospect of being barred from operating in the United States. This is an astonishing situation, Caroline. <laughs> What's also astonishing is how expensive some of those power brokers and lawyers are that they're using. 1500 in that story an hour. Meanwhile, look, let's just talk China a little bit more, but in the context of eSports, the company NIP kicks off trading on the NASDAQ. Co-founder and chairman Mario Ho is going to be joining us. This is Bloomberg Technology. time for Talking Tech. And first up, the SEC is suing short seller Andrew Left and his Citroen Capital. The regulators alleging that Left and Citroen generated about $20 million in illegal profits and is accusing him of committing fraud through stock trades, social media posts and research reports. The SEC says Left would allegedly make a recommendation and then capitalise on the resulting movements on prices far different than what he'd recommended. Left had no immediate comment. Plus, Apple agrees to AI safeguards. The tech giant is the latest company set to adopt a set of voluntary protections for AI crafted by the Biden administration. Apple will join the likes of OpenAI and Alphabet, as well as Microsoft, committing to testing its AI systems for discriminatory tendencies, security flaws, and national security risks. And shares of TSMC fell the most in three months in Taiwan. This as the country's stock market reopened after two days of closures due to a typhoon. The stock decline joining a global rout in tech stocks as investors rethink their AI positions. TSMC's Taiwan listing has now fallen more than 14% from its peak. Caro. Ed. A company not fearful of that volatility is Chinese esports company NIP. It began trading today. It opened at $13.11 after pricing the IPO at $9 per share, which is pulling back to about that $9 level. We're pleased to welcome NIP co-founder and chairman Mario Ho. Mario, why go public in the U.S.? Well, this is the biggest capital markets platform in the world. For us, we've always thought that in order for us to truly go global and to seek partnerships all over the world, we need to be at the biggest exchange. And that for us is NASDAQ. And so give us the thesis. You're going out to the investor base. Obviously, you're trying to woo them on the business model. The business model one is perhaps hard for a U.S. consumer to understand. Because for us, we think China, regulatory crackdown, gaming. But actually, esports is something very different. Well-loved national pride. Absolutely. Esports is well-loved national pride everywhere in the world, every single government. Exemplified by the recent news, the fact that there is going to be an esports Olympics at Saudi Arabia in 2025. I mean, for us, uh, whether it is an investor from China, whether it's an investor from the U.S., the business model of running esports teams, the excitement that comes out of it can be understood by everyone. Our gamers and esports fans in the audience will know that you're the parent company or holding company behind Ninjas in Pajamas in Sweden, ESV5 in China. And you guys talk a lot about the big market opportunity, right? You cite this report that esports globally is going to be a $100 billion a year market by 2027. Your teams do well, but you've booked about $19 million in prize money. So for all the investors watching, how do you make that number a lot bigger? Well, prize money is only one part of our business revenue, which belongs to the part where we run eSport teams. We also do a lot other than that. We also do talent management. We have sort of an IMG where we sign and manage a lot of eSports talent. We also do offline events production, very much like the eSports Live Nation. And in the future, we're going into so many different new avenues like eSports hotels, games publishing. We're definitely going to be raising the overall revenue pie of the company, not just prize money, but that is something we care about because our brands are a very very winning brands you mentioned the impact of having esports at the saudi arabia olympics that's a really interesting global view of this market could you sort of compare and contrast for us the health of esports in the usa against the health of esports in a market like china for example well, I think uh, in terms of monetization and sponsorships, because the U.S. has a very well-functioned uh, traditional platform for traditional sports, I think the esport teams 
tend to do very, very well here. Uh, on the other side, in, in China, for example, you'll see a bigger size of following. More people, bigger population, more population that follows games and esports. So for esport teams in China to rack up a huge following and then to monetize that would also be easier. So it's a different demographic. But in terms of competitiveness, I think it is the same everywhere in the world. And like you said, Saudi Arabia, I would be very excited to see how the U.S. teams pitch against the Chinese teams. And of course, teams from Europe and all Big over time. the world as well. <laughs> Mario, what sort of companies are wanting to really get in on the eSport crescendo? I mean, many sort of think back to ultimately the collapse of FaZe over here in the US and, and a larger than life celebrities involved, but also worrying around the, the commitment to sponsors. What sort of companies are wanting to corral around you and wanting to support some of the players that you represent and the talent that you're going to be managing? Well, first off, I think uh, it is good to have a correction in the esports market globally, uh, where we're now, as esports companies, are, 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 are credited when you're able to prove a path to profitability. And that's great. That's you know, for the overall health of the esports industry worldwide. For us, we have insane sponsorship from all over the world. You see companies like Red Bull, BYD, uh, China Mobile, uh, Fila, Puma, uh, brands that are, targeted to, are targeting towards young people around the world will still find that very attractive to be represented by esports teams and have their logos on our shirts. I, and, and another reason for that that is uh, some companies want to really youngify or turn their brand younger in terms of audience. And for those types of companies, we're the sort of a, a very good partner for them. Mario, Jackson Wang is a huge star, mainland China in particular, huge following, and you've kind of tied League of Legends into his following. Will you replicate that strategy with any other celebrity in Europe or in the USA? Absolutely. We're not saying no to that. Uh, the success of Jackson on its own, but also combining with the gaming audience has been something that's taken the, the market by storm. So if we're able to, if I'm able to form a friendship as strong as the one I have with Jackson here with somebody with a U.S. celebrity, absolutely. But from business perspective, yes, those are all possibilities that we're looking to, to seek into the U.S. markets. Mario Ho, co-founder, chairman and co-CEO of NIP Group. Thank you. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we'll hear from FTC chair Lena Khan about her AI priorities and why she's looking at that industry closely. That's next. I mentioned it earlier. I want to look at Alphabet, parent of Google, real quick. On track for its biggest weekly drop since October. The, the latter part of the week, definitely earnings a factor. But yesterday, news from OpenAI on a beta search GPT. And even though I was off, I noticed that the stock was under pressure in that moment, right? OpenAI finally giving us something tangible about their ambitions for search and certainly something everybody was talking about on social media. How they do, who knows? But clearly, it's having an impact on Alphabet's shares, down 6.5% for the week. Uh, we will be right back with you. A lot more to come. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde in London. Let's have a quick check on these markets because it has been a tumultuous time this week, to say the very least. But we are up this Friday on the Nasdaq six tenths percent, even though we have been down for three straight weeks more broadly on the benchmarks and lost, remember, about a trillion dollars worth of market cap over on the Nasdaq 100. Russell 2000 gains outperforms once again small caps, outshining big tech as we see that rotation in place. Bitcoin, though, a little bit of love. Remember, we have, well, Previous President Trump speaking at the Bitcoin event in Nashville this weekend. We'll see what he says for the crypto scene. We're up 3.5% as risk assets do better across the board. Move on to the individual movers because we have got some in play. And when you're looking at the leaderboard, Charter Communications beats on its earnings. We're up some 15%. Extraordinary movements for this particular company. DoorDash doing well. Of course, we finally get Prop 22 being signed off by the Supreme Court over in California. That does well. And some analysts upgrading on the stock. We're up more than 3%. Dexcom. What a wipeout, 41%. Unexpected cut to 2024 sales forecast. This is a blood sugar monitoring device maker for diabetics. Look, we are starting potentially to see the impact of Azempic and some of those similar weight loss drugs. The CEO wouldn't say whether really they've been impacted by perhaps fewer common type 2 diabetes necessities coming from people as they use that weight loss drug.
Ed, what are you looking at? Glasses. In the news and making moves, Essilor Luxottica, the world's biggest eyewear maker, said Meta is planning to buy a stake in the company. Confirmation. The two companies have already been working together for years and presented their first Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses in 2021. This deal would see the US tech giant further stepping up its pushes into smart glasses. Right, another Meta story. Meta's facing its first EU fine over allegations. It abused its dominance in the classified ad market by tying Facebook Marketplace to its social network. Bringing in Bloomberg's Sam Stolton out of Brussels. Sam, uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, just what, what we through the EU's perspective on this, the, the sort of the angst that the, the Commission has against what Meta did. Yes. Hello from Brussels, Ed and Caroline. And yes, we expect this fine to be issued against Meta in the coming months. And the European Commission has a number of concerns with how the company has tied Facebook marketplace to the Facebook social media network. And what it is set to say, as I say, in the coming months, is that Facebook shouldn't make access to marketplace obligatory on users having a social media account. And it also shouldn't use the data from its rivals. And I'm talking about non, uh, non-public data belonging to classified ads rivals like eBay or Craigslist, etc., to compete against them. Because what the Commission has found is that over the years, Facebook has actually been a space for those types of companies to advertise and promote their services. But what Facebook has actually done with that data could be problematic in terms of an abuse of dominance. Um, so the fine is set to yeah. come in the coming months. We don't exactly know how much it will be. But just a reminder, Brussels does have relatively high fining powers, up to 10% mm. of global annual revenue. So it could be a fairly hefty bill for the Menlo Park firm to pay off. Meta spokesperson saying the claims by the Commission are without foundation at the moment, Sam, and the organisation continues to work constructively with regulators over the issue. What's the chances that they can work constructively here? Because, you know, as a user of Facebook Marketplace, you can understand why you want it tied to the social media platform, because you want to understand about the buyer that's putting in the interest and ultimately it's sometimes really hard to sell things through these sorts of platforms. Yes, Caroline. Indeed. I mean, it has been working with regulators since this case was first launched in the EU in mid-2021. Facebook did actually try to stop this investigation by offering some concessions. Um, It made an agreement actually with the UK's competition authority to stop using this non-public data to compete against classified ad rivals. And that was enough for the UK regulator, but it wasn't enough for DG Comp here at the European Commission in Brussels. It wanted more. Meta wasn't prepared to offer more. And we're in a situation now where it's basically a standoff, but it looks like it's heading towards that fine. And a couple of quite significant behavioural orders as well, which we expect to include an order from the European Commission for Facebook to create a separate portal that users who don't have a Facebook social media account can use to access the Facebook marketplace. Really appreciate you breaking it all down because it's complex. Sam Stolton, go have a wonderful evening over in Brussels. We thank you. Meanwhile, let's talk about another key platform on Meta. It's WhatsApp, and it's hit 100 million monthly active users in the United States, growing its daily audience by double digits. Now, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the new milestone on his WhatsApp channel yesterday. The app has amassed billions of users, of course, worldwide, but more U.S. users would improve Meta's effort to build out WhatsApp's business the U.S. market typically being the most lucrative, eventually, for advertising. Now, back to good old antitrust. FTC chair Lena Khan was in San Francisco and, well, she'd been meeting with members of the business and VC community. She discussed what's on her mind in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Emily Chang, starting with her thoughts around artificial intelligence. Just take a listen. As a general matter, historically, we've seen that openness and open source can be a critical vector of innovation, right? I mean, what happens traditionally when you render some of these ecosystems more open is that it can lower barriers to entry, it can lower costs for entrepreneurs and startups and really uh, enable them to innovate uh, much more freely. And so we want to make sure that that tradition continues. 
we are watching very closely. I think there's still an open question around what openness really means in the AI context. Our team has been focusing on this idea of open weight models, uh, which we think could similarly engender a lot of competition and innovation and make it easier for startups and entrepreneurs to compete on a level playing field. Of course, we need to really closely understand what are any restrictions, licensing restrictions that are being included here, and could those be foreclosing competition? More generally, we also need to be aware of how there are significant incumbents that may have an outsized role to be playing because they have key control over the raw material and key inputs. And so we need to be aware of the broader potential competition issues or bottlenecks or choke points that could emerge in ways that could inhibit innovation and inhibit competition. And so that's what we're going to be talking with founders and VCs and others about today. I do have to take a moment to talk about the presidential election. A number of prominent tech folks have endorsed President Trump for a variety of reasons. But I have heard specifically multiple tech executives and investors complain about how they can't do deals on your watch. Do you have any concerns that your agenda has at all alienated the tech community um, or, or could impact uh, the, the impact of your agenda going forward? You know, it's been such an honor to serve in the Biden-Harris administration, and, you know, we're just focused on, on doing our work. Uh, what I oftentimes hear from the business community, including small businesses, including entrepreneurs, is that they want markets to be more open and more fair and more competitive rather than incumbents being able to squash out nascent competitive threats. I mean, our free enterprise system is one where the best ideas are supposed to win. And we've historically seen that it's the disruptors and entrepreneurs that have been a key vector of innovation. And so our job at the FTC when we enforce the antitrust laws is to make sure that our markets stay open and fair and competitive. And that's something that, you know, most businesses and most entrepreneurs uh, should really be able to get behind. That was FTC Chair Lena Khan and Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Coming up, we'll be joined by Hillel Zidel, Managing Director at Kennett Partners on the firm's brand new fund focused on all things SaaS and all things Europe. This is Bloomberg Technology. Transatlantic growth equity investor Kennett Partners well, has just raised $290 million for its largest fund to date, called Kennett 6, which brings the firm's assets under management to over $1.4 billion. Bringing in Hillel Zadel, Managing Director at Kennett Partners for more. It is great to have some time with you, Hillel. And look, we want to understand about the reputation, the returns you've already given some of your LPs and investors. What kind of companies have you backed? What sort of returns have you got? Hey, Caroline, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so we're investing uh, Kennet 6 right now. Um, we have a long track record, north of 20, uh, 20 plus years investing in the sector. Our focus is on uh, business to business software companies, uh, and in particular, those that have been bootstrapped and, uh, you know, get, getting to a great close on Kennet 6. Uh, in order to do that, you need to have a strong track record, and we're delighted uh, to have that. Um, Kennet 6 is a continuation of what we've been doing with our prior funds, and we're really excited about what we're seeing in the market right now. Hello, what's the backstory for, for wanting to focus on SaaS? Um, a few things. Firstly, you know, scalability. These companies um, can scale very rapidly. They have high gross margins. Um, they are predictable businesses. And within SaaS, uh, we focus particularly on business-to-business -business companies and really those that are mission-critical or essential to their underlying customers. What we really care about is, is this company solving a real problem uh, of their customer? Um, one of the unique aspects of our particular strategy is on bootstrapped SaaS companies. That's businesses that have been built by the founders without relying on external capital. These are companies that are very different to the traditional venture capital business of raising large sums of money, going out, spending, raising more. The companies we're investing in have been built to scale by their founders with very limited resources. And that's a strategy that we think provides our investors with really compelling risk-adjusted returns. 
and also clean cap tables too. I'm interested in sort of trying to avoid hype cycles here, Hillel. I'm looking at some of the previous investors. Cross-border solutions, 6X at the moment, is an AI-driven tax and transfer pricing solutions. You've got financial automation software platform. I can imagine a lot of the founders you're now going to be looking to have had to in some way describe their business as artificial intelligence at its heart. How do you get out of some of the heady, hypey valuations when you start targeting that? Yeah, I mean, that's a super relevant question. I think, you know, we came out of a momentum cycle of 2020 to 2022 when prices were really high. Uh, you know, lots of investors were coming in and investing in technology. Um, that's corrected. We're now in a more moderate environment. And then AI comes along and, you know, it's creating another level of level of hype. Um, our view is that, um, you know, we need to be investing in good businesses, good management teams, good strategies at, you know, the right pricing. Um, we, we don't have a FOMO style investing. We're not trying to find the next unicorn. We're not trying to find, um, you know, the next, uh, the next big thing. We believe that just sticking to, you know, rational investing is the right way to, the right way to, uh, you know, to, to be successful in this category. Yeah. That being said, AI is real. AI is, in our view, you know, the next platform shift, you know, post mobile, post the internet. Um, but I think we're at that particular point in the market where the reality, you know, needs to catch up a little bit with the hype that's out there. And I think you're seeing that in uh, in the market in general, with you know, huge investment going into uh, infrastructure, into LLMs, and limited commercial yeah. value, commercial revenue at that point. And 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 I think it's going to happen, but it's going to take time. Hello, it's a euro-denominated fund, and, and you're in London. We got, we got a new government in London. Just explain all of that, please. Absolutely. So we invest uh, in Europe, uh, in the UK, and in the US, and we're really looking for the best businesses that we can support in their scale. So you know, investing in businesses in the UK, uh, we recently invested, uh, as you showed earlier, in a company called Screen Dragon, which is a business between UK and Ireland. Um, our objective, you know, with this and many other companies is really around expansion. So, you know, where we're investing in the UK company, we want to help build a world-class management team around the founders. We want to support these companies expanding internationally and ultimately develop strategies that maximize, you know, the value uh, going forward. I think for us, the key point is, is the business we're investing in serving an international market? You know, we're not really focused on companies that only serve domestic markets. It's much more about... Uh, can this business scale uh, and ser serve customers across multiple uh, multiple geographies? Hello, Zadell, Managing Director at Kennet Partners. Thank you. All right, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, we break down the impacts of last week's crowd strike outage with Jennifer Teada, CEO of PagerDuty, and how the company plays a vital role in identifying and preventing incidents just like this one. This is Bloomberg Technology. They're spending over a billion dollars when they're here in Paris. So we're seeing really good demand this summer. I think Q3 is going to be quite strong. And I think this event, the Olympics, is just the ultimate demonstration of the power of Airbnb. Oh, we're talking Olympics and just hours ahead of the Olympics opening ceremony, trains going to and from Paris were hit by an arson attack. Fires set three critical rail line nodes, causing delays for 800,000 passengers. The identity of the, of the attack attackers is not yet known. Meanwhile, train delays are not the only concern. Look, the Olympics cyber team is bracing for attacks at this year's Games after France was already the target of hacks that shut down a film festival last month. In further Olympic news, get this, Canadian women's soccer head coach Bev Priestman was removed from the team after flying a drone over an opponent's training session. There had been prior instances of this by the head coach, according to the statement from Canada Soccer CEO, confirming Priestman's suspension. Ed, a lot of news. A lot of news and back to CrowdStrike. 97% of CrowdStrike sensors are now back online after last week's outage, Bloomberg's reported. But there are growing concerns that incidents like this are part of a new normal. It's something I wrote about last week in Tech Daily. PagerDuty is a cloud computing company that plays an important role as an early warning system for incidents like this. PagerDuty CEO Jennifer Tejada joins us now 
for, for more. What was that like for you, that 24-hour or four-day period when the outage happened? We just explained what Pager Judy does. So you must have been at your desk thinking, OK, we've got something to do here. Look, I mean, these are the moments that were designed and built and prepared for. Um, I'm especially proud of our technology and software and operations team because despite our platform coming under significant surges in traffic, incidents, uh, we saw at the peak, we saw nearly 200% spike in the number of incidents that are normally processing on the platform. Um, over 2.6 million events, which is you know significantly higher than what we see in any typical hour uh, and a 1,425% increase in the number of incident workflows that our customers are running on the platform. So just seeing our technology stand up uh, you know, in, in, a, in a very reliable and resilient way under that kind of pressure uh, makes me very proud of our team, but also is just a good reminder that the effort that we undertake uh, to build operational resilience, to prepare for these um, unexpected but um, really challenging moments you have to anticipate them you have to invest in the yeah. infrastructure the redundancy and the resilience to deliver when the time comes jennifer is this going to happen more it is happening more absolutely i mean our customers saw uh, nearly a 45 percent increase in customer facing incidents just uh, year on year um, we we are seeing uh, the number of major incidents on the platform increase. These are incidents that have uh, material or or reasonable business impact. And that's because uh, most of consumer engagement with brands, financial transactions today are taking place on digital apps that are supported by complex infrastructure, technology infrastructure, some of which is, is aging and some of which is increasing in its complexity because we're able to ship new products and services all the time every day into this ecosystem and that complexity is going to continue to grow with the advent of generative AI. Jen, I, I just want to point out to our audience, we've made every effort to get George Kurtz, the CrowdStrike CEO on this program um, on a daily basis and he's yet to do so. And the reason I flag that is so many IT managers, CISO, CIO, cybersecurity managers watch the program. They have very specific questions. The chief among them question is, you know, is this a preventable event or is this the, the sort of state of doing business now in the world that we live in? Well, I think this is a good reminder that anybody who is responsible for technology in a business and every business now is a technology business is responsible for making sure they have good practices in place and good controls in place around technology change and around the ability to respond or roll back when a change uh, does work in, ineffectively. But the reality is human error, technology fred, fragility and tech debt in our aging uh, technology infrastructure, cybersecurity threat, uh, et cetera, all of these things create a more dynamic uh, and volatile environment for the technology ecosystems we've grown to rely on. And that means that we have to make the investments in our infrastructure in modernizing not only our technology, but the way we operate. So when these things yeah. do happen, and they will, that we can handle them more effectively. And you know, one of the reasons that PagerDuty is architected the way it is, is because these events in particular are unstructured, they're unpredictable, and yet they're high impact and high value. So getting back to recovery of these systems is really important. But also, this is a tremendous opportunity for everybody in industry, not just folks who were affected by the outage last week, but folks that weren't, to double down on investing in infrastructure, on preparing, on improving their resilience, on practicing things like chaos engineering, tabletop exercises, and also communicating to customers the importance of redundancy, having multiple systems, uh, failover practices, documentation, yeah. even how we onboard people. And you know, that is one thing I wanted to underscore. One of the things we haven't been talking about a lot is the people who have been working 24 by right. seven to get systems back online. We talk a lot about right. automation, generative AI right now, but the human needs Jennifer. to be in the loop. <laughs> well said. The people behind this technology, Jennifer Tejada, we thank you so much, CEO of PagerDuty. Have a wonderful weekend. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Incredible week, incredible show. Check out the pod. This is Bloomberg.